first, let's turn the lights on. Welcome, everyone, to the Comprehensive Plan Economic Development Existing Conditions and Trends presentation. My name is Carol Kowalski. I'm the Assistant Town Manager for Development. I oversee the offices that are involved in permitting, developing, and conserving land and businesses. And I want to introduce a few people who are very important to the Comprehensive Plan. Richard Canale, who is the chair of the planning board and the co-chairs of the Comprehensive Plan Advisory Committee. If you could raise your hand, Sarah Felton and Ray Yuan, and members of the Comprehensive Plan Advisory Committee. Carol Suhey, if you'll raise your hand so people can see who you are. And Len Morse-Fortier. And Hema Bott. Okay. I think I got everyone from the Comprehensive Plan Advisory Committee and the planning board. So we're going to start with a few slides to describe economic development and why it's important. And then we're going to get to the really fun stuff with Melissa Tintopoulos, our economic development director. So this is just, uh, there are probably people in the room who are much more informed than I am about some of the technical details of economic development. But we wanted to make sure we provided some basics so that everyone can enjoy and understand and appreciate Melissa's presentation at the same level as possible. So what is local economic development? Uh, a little bit of history first. Through much of the 20th century, local economic development referred to a central government assisting with underdeveloped places around the globe. The US Chamber of Commerce began industrial conferences in 1926. Then with the Great Society programs, in the US from the mid 1960s through the 1980s, we saw federal, state, and local job creation and investment programs to revitalize and develop historically underserved communities, often using urban renewal. From the 1980s on, the post war expansion had ended, global trade, automation, and the internet presented new challenges and opportunities. Even for stable suburbs, local government leaders were then asked to address economic development challenges at the local level. I have a band-aid on my thumb, so it's very hard to turn pages. So there are many definitions you can find in the field, but they all include language broadly related to securing livelihoods, improving infrastructure, <coughs> and managing local resources. Here is one definition that could be universal. To achieve sustainable growth, to bring economic benefits and improved quality of life for all residents in a local municipal area. So what is economic development? It's about creating and sustaining wealth in a city, community, or region. We know that it is occurring when new jobs are being created Existing jobs are being maintained when the standard of living is improving and there is a real increase in the level of average household income when the equity of income distribution is improving and the local tax base is keeping pace with the mounting cost of government services, when businesses and industry are creating quality jobs and when the local quality of life keeps getting better. Economic growth is about bigger, more jobs, larger tax base, more investment in the regional economy. Economic development is about better, better jobs, higher household income, more innovation, widely shared benefits, and an improved local economic structure why is economic de development important to us? It's important because it spurs private investment. It improves job creation and retention. It increases the tax base and property values, and it brings prosperity into the town or region. A strong basic economy has external demand, bringing money into the region, which is better than circulating money that's already in the region. A strong basic economy weathers a slump better than one that depends only on local demand. 
This is just a little paraphrasing of economic base theory, and a lot of you in the audience are probably experts on economic base theory, so I hope you can bear with that simplification. It's also important for reducing poverty, for economic stability and self-sufficiency and resiliency. These are very important objectives because you want to be able to withstand and recover quickly from economic downturns. Lastly, economic development is valued for the quality of life it provides. And I appreciate that Melissa often reminds me of that, and it's, it's valid. And it's valid for these reasons. The quality of life in economic development is subjective, but there is broad agreement that it includes having quality housing, an educated workforce, the presence of colleges and universities, a low crime rate, and safe environment, availability of good medical and health care. And we know an area is thriving when there's a variety of retail and services. There are lodging and restaurant options. There's an attractive and clean environment, good traffic flow and mobility options, and good cultural and recreational opportunities. When you think about when you travel, and you go to a new city that you've never, or a new town that you've never been to before, and you see that it has these things, you look around and say, this place is happening. And we may not think of it as, oh, this place is doing well with its economic development, but those are some quality of life benefits. There are just three more slides, and then we'll get to the fun stuff. With Melissa. Economic development in the US is analyzed and measured by a unit of geography called a labor market area. A labor market area is simply a single metro or major city and its surrounding region or sphere of influence. You might also think of it as the distance people commute to get to the, the, the dominant job center. So two closing concepts to bear in mind with economic, local economic development. As we have now begun to consider ways to sustain economic benefits for future generations, new concepts have arisen. One is recognizing the difference between equality and equity. Some of you have seen variations on this graphic. Equality means giving everyone the same things. Equity means giving people what they need to succeed or to thrive. Both aim for fairness, but equality isn't always fair unless everyone has the same needs and starts from the same starting point. So it, you probably already figured out in this graphic, everyone on the equality side here who's trying to see this game has been handed the same fruit crate to stand on. But they aren't starting from the same starting place, so they can't see the game. So this symbolizes everyone can see the game recognizing that they may have different needs. The, the other closing concept is the idea of triple bottom line. Uh, more and more in economic development, the idea of the three Ps, people, planet, and profits, have become very important. Because if you're not considering the three Ps, you aren't focused on accounting for the full cost of doing business. So those are two things that if you're trying to have a sustainable local economic development or regional or national or federal or international, you really want to be making sure you're focused on the three Ps. So with these basics in mind, Lexington Economic Development Director Melissa Tintakalis will now present Lexington's existing economic development conditions and recent trends that are important as we update the town's comprehensive plan. Thank you, Carol. Um, I'm going to do a quick switch on the slides here. One second. If I can. Okay. Found it. Okay. Great. 
Well, thank you all for coming out here this evening. Really appreciate your interest in you being um, part of this comprehensive plan. Um, I think Carol did a great job. Thank you for kind of setting the stage of where economic, what economic development is. Um, you know, and I also see it kind of as a spectrum um, and where you kind of want to go. A lot of communities interpret it very different. Um, you know, we were talking about it with Sarah a little bit in that, you know, I was just at um, in Concord and they were talking about economic development, but they, they were saying, well, we really don't really want to see development in that sense without kind of going through the definitions that Carol went through. They really wanted to see kind of what they were calling it more economic vitality because they wanted to see kind of growth and betterment, but their way of de kind of um, defining that was a little different. And, you know, I think, you know, it's something that is going to be part of the discussion on the comp plan going forward. Um, and this is just to lay some basic kind of data points for you. There's a landscape of data out there and a lot of people um, have not seen it all together. So today I'm here just to kind of share with you the information we have. Um, so it's like kind of that we're all starting at the same kind of starting point with the information. So um, this evening I'll just go through our commercial environment, some basic economic metrics, give you a little bit of uh, information on the real estate market and what it looks like um, kind of from the commercial real estate perspective. Um, talk a little bit about assessed values and tax revenue because those are the driving engines to the quality of life within Lexington. Um, share a little bit of what we've learned, how we spend our money in Lexington, and then talk a little bit about uh, the visitor-based economy. Um, as we'll go through here, I just wanted to also let you know that we talk a lot about what our neighbors are doing, what peer communities are doing. So we'll have these slides on the website, but this is just to lay out specifically the peers and comparable communities that we reference throughout this presentation and others. Um, Lexington tends, you know, it's 33,000 um, folks. We have a square, the area is about 16 square miles. And we do have a split tax rate. And as you'll see into the presentation, that has a, has a different impact for the businesses and for the tax revenue that's generated. Um, you can see Needham also has that, Burlington, Waltham. Um, these two are often not necessarily looked at as peers, but more as our neighbors and our geographic comparables for the area. Bedford and Concord looking a little bit more like us in kind of the attributes. Um, but noting that Concord and Arlington do not have split tax rates. Um, and that's a key thing we'll be kind of zeroing in on as we go on. So I'll tell you a little bit about our commercial environment without getting too into um, land use, because actually that's a whole separate uh, element in the comp plan that you haven't got to yet. So basically, I'm trying to see how well this shows up. Um, this is a map of Lexington's land uses. And you can see this, um, it's kind of not showing up here, but it's showing up on my screen on the next one. But we are 16 square miles, as I mentioned. If you look through here, in terms of the commercial zoned areas, we have nine different commercially zoned areas. And in each of those areas, you can do or you're allowed to do certain things with your business or with your commercial property. And that we can discuss a little bit more in detail. And when you take that kind of picture and you move all these parcels into kind of a, a geographic kind of size map and lay it out, what you start to see is something that's pretty obvious for a lot of us. We are primary residential community. We have a lot of open space. We've been prioritizing that over the years. And we really only have 6% of our land is zoned for commercial use. So although there's nine different ways to segment that 6%, at the end of the day, it's only 6% of our land is dedicated to commercial um, uses. Often then we're asked, well, how does that compare to our neighbors? So we thought we'd give you kind of some context. And Arlington, similarly, it's a, a lot smaller, it's only five square miles, um, but only 6% of that area is zoned commercial. Burlington, 44% of that zoned commercial. 
Um, and Concord, which does pride itself in its history of um, conservation, has only 2.4% um, zone for commercial uses. So what I'll show you now is looking at what, what are our commercial areas. Um, and those of you who've been here for a long time or kind of know the area well, know that these are kind of our large commercial districts. You have Hartwell, Hayden, and Forbes Road. So Forbes Road is out right here. There's only really four, four to five parcels there. It's small. BAE Systems is there. Thank you. Um, BAE Systems is there. Defense Technology. Hayden Avenue down here by Route 2 um, is where our Shire and Decatur is located. And the previously named, I was Cubist at one time. Um, and then Hartwell, which is our largest commercial district, um, mostly bit back in the 60s and 70s, pretty nondescript business park, um, and how we've seen it kind of evolve over time has been kind of evolving towards a life science cluster for Lexington. Um, and through the process, I know um, the Comprehensive Plan Committee also wanted to make sure that we focused on our small commercial nodes, and not to really forget those, because those are still areas that, you know, not only contribute to the kind of the day-to-day -day life for folks, um, but have some, you know, have some uses that, you know, may serve the community or may be needed to be updated over time. So we want to take a look at those. It's Merritt Square. Hi there. Um, East Lexington, countryside up to the right. Um, a lot of people don't know that over by Market Basket um, in Burlington, that area is kind of the town boundary splits through that. So on the other side of Market Basket, where Cycle Loft is, that falls into Lexington. And then, of course, we have Lexington Center, which I feel is kind of the gem of our community. Not only is it you know, a beautiful kind of um, hub of mix of uses, civic, business, residential, um, but it really defines of who we are as Lexington. And I think a lot of people have pride in that. We know the town meeting just approved the center streetscape. Um, and this area has about 58 parcels with over 250 businesses located in the center business district. So sticking with what you know, it looks like in the built environment, I'll just show you a couple slides that kind of, again, illustrate the fact that you know, this is a, we are working with a primarily residential area and our commercial is rather limited. Um, the assessor has to divide every property into a classification, and a residential, and what kind of residential, and then um, commercial and industrial buildings. So you can see here, in terms of all of our buildings, we have about almost 12,000 buildings in Lexington, and 9,000 of those buildings are single family homes. We have a few kind of options, condos, two families. Um, and then we just have, you know, 463 buildings that are commercial in town. Now, granted, some of those are quite large, um, but that's kind of where we are building-wise. And this development has happened, you know, primarily, I mentioned, in the 60s and 70s. You can see kind of the, kind of the agrarian history that we have, the kind of no limited development. This is a graph showing building permits over time. And then you start to see it pick up in the 50s and 60s. Um, it correlates to some of the work that we started seeing once MIT Lincoln Lab was established in Hanscom, um, the Air Force and the defense technology that was coming out of Hanscom, and it started to have these spin-offs. And that's where you start to see some of the commercial development popping up around Hartwell. Hartwell, for those of you who have been here long enough, know that was before it was just its own working wetlands. It turned into, does anyone know? Before it, it was the road to the town. Thank you. Town dump. <laughs> yes. We've, a lot, we've evolved a lot since the time we used, we used to use Hartwell as the town dump. It's since been capped, and then back in the 60s and 70s, we saw a lot of development in that area. Um, but like a lot of communities, cautious about what was going on, back in the 80s, we started to address the development by turning down 
the ability to develop without some better oversight by the town. And we saw the drop off. And once you change those zoning laws, you saw the drop off in development in the 80, kind of early 90s and 2000s. You see a little pickup, um, but that's what we're seeing today. So overall, today we have about 8.9 million square feet of commercial in Lexington. And you can see this is just a graph. The yellow is from 2010, just shortly after the recession. And then where we are today, 2018, is the blue. So you've seen a little growth in Lexington, not so much in um, Bedford. Um, between Burlington and Waltham, our neighbors to the north and south, and that's 2.5 2 million square feet has been built during that time. So I, I know we hear a lot about traffic and we think about cut through traffic, um, just so we just kind of keep in mind that they are still growing and that 2.5 million square feet is still bringing traffic and jobs as well, cutting through. Um, so that's kind of what we look like physically. And so what now I'll do is show you a little bit of what's inside these buildings and what's going on inside in terms of businesses and employment. On a very high level, you know, we have 22,567 jobs. Um, for most communities, that's really exciting. The closer you are to um, essentially the rule of thumb in a lot of communities has been to get to the number of jobs as you have people in your community. And that just is a, sh a sign that not only do you have employment options for the people who are living in town, that's not just a bedroom community, um, it also is a sign of indication on your commercial tax revenue as well that you have provide those spaces. So 22,567 jobs, um, that's kind of fitting in with 1,346 business establishments. Um, our top employer, private employer, is MIT Lincoln Labs. Takeda um, is coming in second, which is formerly Shire. Um, and then BAE Systems, Brookhaven, as well as Cotting School. And I kind of like this top five mix. Um, in my mind, I see a little bit how it's reflective of what really Lexington is in some ways. Um, you know, we've, we've been really smart and have had the permitting and some of the staff be very technologically aware so that we can accommodate pe people like or businesses like Takeda. Um, BAE Systems is a reflection of the ge geographic location near Hanscom. I had talked about defense technology. BAE Systems is part of that. Then Brookhaven to me is also a fact of, you know, we've talked about the, boom the boomers or the silver tsunami. You know, Brookhaven is an assisted or kind of what do we call that? Continuing uh, care. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Continuing care. So it offers a wide spectrum of assistance for people as you age. Um, and then Cotting School is actually this really interesting story of this school who has been around since the late 1800s and has been supporting kids with special needs and giving them a special education and a special um, experience there right here within our town boundaries. And I think that's a nice nod to the value we put on education here in our community. Melissa. Yeah. Can I yes. just ask, I don't know if everyone can hear me, in that list, um, the, and Pete might know this, the public school system in Lexington, do we know the number of employees? I would say seven. 1700, right. So we did not put that on. I think um, it's something that we should kind of be, you know, maybe we fold into that. But um, what Sarah's asking me is just, we had the private sector employment figures. If you consider the town of Lexington and the school district, then you're looking at them as one of the top employers for the community, exactly. So this still takes into account all the jobs. So this graph comes from Esri Data. Esri Data comes from um, a classic data source that you can get online with a subscription. A lot of corporate high-end businesses kind of turn to Esri and Esri um, business analysts for information um, where to locate. Um, so this helps you kind of, kind of just get a sense of where things, where your highest job density is. And not surprisingly, um, we see a high job density. This blue outline is Lexington. The high job density is up there to the right in the Hartwell corridor. 
And then you have Lexington Center as well as the Hayden Corridor. Um, And that kind of, oh, this is kind of our business establishments over time. So looking at this since 2007 to 2017, we've had an uptick of about 11% in our job establishments. Those of you who want to know, be, this is still um, kind of by industry now, so we want to know where these jobs are coming from, what category. We look to um, the department or the Office of um, Labor and Workforce, and they use NAICS codes. NAICS codes are industry standard on how you classify the type of business activity that is going on. And so if you look through this, you can pretty much see that our largest sector or industry sector is this professional and technical services. And then coming in second, we have the educational services as well as well, actually, healthcare, and then you have the social um, social assistance as well as education. So these two here and this one. Those are our largest industries. This one can also share that same information, and it shows you again from the the yellow bar is 2007, and the blue bar is 2017. So a matter of 10 years, we've had an increase in those uh, industry categories. And if we wanted to drill down, a lot of people ask me when I'm presenting this, what is professional business services and you know, what is our you know, education and health services? So if you kind of dig a little bit, the highest um, categories within those is scientific R&D. We have 6,404 jobs or employees. And then you have healthcare and social assistance at 3,116 employees. And this last one is just a longer list of the top and private employers. Again, this will all be on the web, so you can kind of revisit this. And where people are coming and going. So, you know, this is kind of, here's our built environment. Here's where, you know, okay, what's housed in there. And how are people getting? What is that flow? So this was talked a little bit at the transportation element in terms of where people are coming from and where people are going. Um, because we have those 22,000 some odd jobs, we do have a lot of people coming into Lexington. We have a few people that stay within the area. At this point, based on the census, we have 1,561 people saying so they stay within the boundaries. And then we have a lot of people, 12,500 or so, that go out towards the Boston-Cambridge area. With that, most of them are single occupancy uh, vehicle drivers. They're driving their own car. Um, but one thing that we want to share with people related to that commuter pattern is those people who are coming into Lexington, we did offer an alternative mode of transportation called the REV, and we started this as a pilot four years ago. And we have seen an uptick on the use of that. So those people who are coming in, they're not, I mean, if they have some options, if, and this pilot program shows that there's an indication that a willingness to use a transit option. We started this back in, at least this data captures 2015 to today, which is, or last year, 2018. And in 2018, we had over 20,000 rides, and that's a 50%, 56% increase over that period. So are there any questions before we move on on that, those two kind of bigger pieces? Okay, everyone's still awake. <laughs> okay, um, we'll move on to some assessed value information and tax revenue. This one, uh, again, just a reminder of where we're coming from on that 6% um, of our commercial area. And what I'd like to show you is, again, probably not too surprising in that um, where a lot of the value exists in our commercial properties. If you were um, looking at our town and looking at these commercial assets, if you will, where are the most valuable properties? Um, and so based on the most recent assessed value of these properties, coming from the assessor's department, um, Spring and Hayden has over uh, $400 billion worth of property tax or property value, not taxes, 
And I just want to be clear because I will explain how that, it's just the value of that asset. Hartwell comes in second. Lexington Center, those uh, 58 parcels that I mentioned, 129, uh, 28 billion. Million. Thank you, million. Yeah. No? No. Million has six zeros. So we're missing our zeros. <laughs> is that really supposed to be billion? No. no. Uh, in 100 million value. No, that's correct. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> I've been working through billions and millions. When you add them up, it ends up in billions. So that is 120 million. Um, all of the other smaller commercial nodes that we have that I showed you from Merit to uh, Countryside add up to 107 million, and then we have Forbes Road, that is 89 million. So we wanna look at how that assessed value is done over time. Often you hear that it's been, it's plateaued a little over time, and that we've lost some of the commercial or industrial and personal property taxes, CIP value over time. So this one, is one that town manager has used um, at town meeting, and it shows the value over time. Again, now so this blue line is showing you the assessed value of all the houses, all the residential properties in Lexington. And this one is showing you the value, again, now we're in the billions. Okay, so now we're in the billions because we're aggregating it. Um, so all the commercial properties back in 1982 was about 907 hundred million. Today, the housing stock that exists in Lexington is worth 10.5 billion. Now this increase is not only a, it's appreciation, but it's also the tear down and new growth that people talk about. And what we've seen like back in the 80s when we talk about having kind of a things that were a little closer and we shared, and it was probably about 80, at one point in 86, we had 24% of our value came from the commercial property taxes. Today, it's been flat, relatively plateau, and today, of the total value, only 11% of the total value comes from commercial property tax. So it hasn't decreased necessarily, but it hasn't obviously kept pace with the residential properties. And, the, and I think intuitively people who own property within Lexington and the greater Boston area understand that it's also the tighter housing market that we've seen here. Um, so it's a reflection of that the appreciation, and then what we haven't been able to do, and we talked about this with the town manager, is split that um, to understand how much of this gap now is appreciation and how much is it, how much has it come from um, redeveloped residential properties and um, new square footage. Um, with that, I'll take you to the next comparison kind of going back here. Um, so really focusing on this piece now, um, which is the total commercial value. We want to know how does that compare with Burlington, uh, Waltham, and Bedford. So we took 2009 data and we compared it to 2019 data, that 10 year period to see what the increase in just the commercial, what they call CIP, commercial, industrial, and personal property tax. That's kind of, they, that's how they clump it in the assessors. So we wanted to look at that in the different communities. Um, you know, you see Burlington and Waltham, nearly 50% in both of those communities, an increase in that commercial value. Lexington, not too shabby at 30%, and Bedford at 24%. But that's a lot, I, you know, my read is a lot of that is appreciation. We know by kind of based on the, um, the building permits, there hasn't been that much new growth in terms of square footage for the commercial. So those buildings and that value that we talked about, so going back to this piece here, 
this value, this $1.3 billion of value gets taxed. And it gets taxed at a higher rate. We are in a town that has okayed a split tax rate. Burlington has it, Waltham has it, and Bedford has it. And then you can adjust it. So between, with the DOR, with the state regs, you're allowed to do that. Um, so for every $1,000 of value we see in that kind of lineup, Lexington taxes $27.69. Uh, $27 yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, do you know what year that was put in place, the split tax? Yes, it was in 1980. Yep. No, 1980. So also similarly, when we changed the um, land use zoning, about the time we started changing the land use, when we saw a spike in that development, going back to those bars that were up and down, there was a change to the land use, and there was more of an acknowledgement. Let's you know split the tax rate and kind of charge the commercial or the commercial users. Um, I like to point this out because not everyone knows this, that um, the commercial tax rate, that higher rate, whether you're a small business owner in you know, a small 1,000 square foot business or whether you're a large corporate entity, you're paying the same rate. We do not have any exemption or anything for the small business owner. So oftentimes, um, what we hear in our office is that between the two, the corporate guys can really absorb the commercial taxes. It's not a disincentive for lo locating in Lexington. It is a disincentive and it does become onerous for the small business owner. So, you know, kind of just the last step of what this value piece is, is what, how it translates to tax dollars for us. You know, a lot of people say we need economic development because we need tax dollars. Well, you do need to see a lot of added growth to realize new tax, new tax dollars. Um, I can show you here, you know, if we have $1.1 billion of assessed value, that's about 9% of the total. Because the way our taxes work, that 9.9 .9 billion generates every year 3.15 million dollars to the general fund. 17%. It's higher. So, and similarly, I'll, I, um, we have the counterpart to that is obviously the residential. We have the 10.5 billion dollars of value in homes, about 89% of all the value. It generates one. $149 million, which is less than the total value at 80% of the total revenue that's brought in. Are there any questions on this piece? Well, just yeah. I have a comment. Yes. Commercial property and industrial property is assessed differently than residential property because there aren't enough comparable sales. So we frequently find that a building is sold for 44 million, but it's assessed for 30 million. Mm -hmm. So splitting the tax rate isn't exactly making them pay that much more than the real value of their buildings. It's just the way that the assessing works and the communities are at a disadvantage in attempting to have them assess for their sale value as just as homes are assessed. True. Um, the valuations are sometimes dependent on what they call a sales comparison. So you look at your neighbors and you look at what's like that and how it's, what it sold for recently. Or you can do an income comparison where you're doing what you get for rent on that property. So oftentimes they do a blend of sales and an income comparison. Um, and that's only because the sales aren't as frequent as a home, right? And so you can have very similar buildings, one in Lexington and one in Bedford, and they can both be valued very differently. And what the assessors will tell you is it might be, you know, kind of the geographic desirability, access, um, it could, even if the two buildings were exactly the same, they could be valued differently. So it's something to um, be aware of, but, um, from what I've seen recently, 
that hasn't, they have, they've been assessed more accurately, I'll say that. <laughs> yes, hi. Did you want to wait to the end for questions, or should we just start? If you have something easy, I think, I'm happy to take a question. Well, I'm just afraid I'm going to forget these numbers in my head. Okay. Any longer. I'm interested in the comparison between Lexington and Burlington. Okay. Burlington has a smaller population than us. Their square footage, commercial square footage, I think was 4x, uh, something like 8 million versus 32 million square feet of commercial. Mm -hmm. The tax rate is almost the same on commercial. And what I'm wondering is, is their town government just a wash in money, or <laughs> is their assessed value on commercial per square foot like a lot, lot less? So even though they have a lot more and you're taxing at the same rate, the value is much less. I understand what you're saying, and we'd have to look into it. We haven't, I don't know that off the top of my head. Um, and it might have to be an analysis by, I'd have to double check that if it's per property. Because you're looking at, is that total sum of buildings, of the total asset, how, much, how are they valuing it? Yeah, is it four times? Like right. Three? I guess the other thing that could be different is the, um, the percentage of residential property taxes contributing to the whole revenue. Because maybe they're, rather than 80-20, maybe they're at 60-40 or something like that. So taxpayers are getting a break. Right. Um, I didn't do too much more comparison on um, Burlington specifically, but we could do that a little bit more into this process for a reference point. So, But that would be something to do so it's apples to apples, is what you're saying. So with that, we're um, almost done. We have a couple more sections that I want to just cover. I um, want to cover a little bit of how we're spending our money and then touch on the uh, visitor base economy, and then we'll just open it to questions. So this piece is just about, this is interesting to me. Most of you know this already. This is just the basic demographics of Lexington. So not surprisingly, we have a high, uh, a well-educated population. Um, that generally translates for most people into higher incomes and disposable incomes. Um, we are somewhat diverse, uh, diverse in terms of our community. Again, not surprising for a lot of people who live here. Um, but what I thought was interesting to share a little bit is the ESRI data on you know, how we're spending our money. So we do have a large amount of disposable income. And where is that going for most Lexington residents? So um, annual household spending here shows that most of that is going to healthcare or healthcare related costs. The second thing is groceries. If you look at the profile of who's living here, we spend a lot on groceries, mostly because it's organic. Um, we take pride in some of the food that you know goes into the, bo the body. Um, and that's partly, and if you can look at some of the data related to the education piece. Um, you go out a lot. There's also a lot of travel, actually three times the national average, the Lexington residents does um, international travel, three times the national average. And so we're spending a lot on travel. Um, also just kind of the arts, not surprisingly, um, theater, concerts, movies, and we go out. And there's a lot more spent here, almost twice the national average on, on well, this says sporting events. Um, which is more entertainment, but if there's another layer of data that also shows how much we're spending on um, extracurricular type of sports and uh, fitness, and that's higher than the average as well. And this is important because um, businesses, when they're looking at ESRI data, they want to know how we spend money and whether we should kind of locate, if they should locate here or not. Um, the other data point they look at is the concept of leakage. Uh, leakage and it's really here how they, how they lay it out. This is, again, kind of from Esri. And it's a metric used by a lot of businesses on the supply and demand, how much money is staying within the community, and how much money is going out to access goods or services. So what we did was just try to lay out the high leakages, meaning a lot of money is going outside of Lexington, um, drinking places, just a pub or a place to have some beer, um, merchandise store, general merchandise stores, which are not department stores, the small kind of retailers, retail stores, building supplies all outside of Lexington. The closer that factor is here to 100, 
the higher the leakage. And these are your top leakages. Um, what's staying inside Lexington? Yes, how can I help? And given how many people in Lexington drive, how much money leaves here in, in gasoline? It strikes me that that would be a large number, but I don't see it anywhere. So we didn't pull out the disposable income that was spent on these categories, but we could. So I didn't pull that out today. But gasoline actually is a low, um, a lower, a lower leakage category, meaning that you do buy a lot of gas in here. Now, how much are you spending going out and transporting yourself? We don't refine oil here. So even if you buy your gas from an electricity <coughs> gas station, that money doesn't stay here. From an economic point of view, I can think of nothing more suicidal than spreading people all over the place so they have to drive everywhere because we don't make gasoline. So I'm trying to understand where that factors in. I don't see it anymore. Does it help to think of it as purchasing power? The purchasing power of Lexingtonians, does this help, Melissa? Yeah. Um, the purchasing power of Lexingtonians, there's a lot of that purchasing power leaving Lexington to have high leakage. Where there's low leakage, the purchasing power of Lexingtonians is staying in Lexington. I don't know if that helps. It doesn't, because even if I buy gasoline in Lexington, that money doesn't stay in Lexington. The transaction, I think they're trying to capture the transaction. The money might go, but the transaction, the establishment is what is captured here. It's some of that multiplier effect stays in Lexington. Right, so, right. So the, if we're talking about the transaction entity. And so if I was a bookstore, for example, and I was looking between locating here or Arlington or Burlington, I would look at this and use this metrics and find, oh, their factor on bookstores, 78, a lot of them are going out, physically going out or spending their money elsewhere outside the town. There would be a potential to locate here and capture some more of that demand. Yes? So that's not the money that's staying in the town. That's people leaving the town to go to drinking places or people leaving the town to go to general merchandise. Right. So I'm leaving Lexington okay. gotcha. to go to the Burton Grill gotcha. to have a drink. Okay. Does this capture online sales, like for books, periodicals, music? Um, you know, that's a good question. I think I'll have to get back to you on that one because, I, yeah, we, I don't remember. We did talk about that, but I'm not sure again. Like to tell a check that. Leakage that's hard to fight. Right. <laughs> that's true. Yeah, I mean, and that kind of goes to a separate thing. I mean, again, this is supposed to be just kind of objective data, but shopping local has been, um, you know, a driving force in a lot of communities, and we could talk about that. So I'll do just a quick run on the vacancies here. Um, just so you know where people stand, where we stand from a real estate perspective. So I feel like what I'm trying to share with you is kind of here's our built environment, here's what's inside our built environment, here's how our residents are spending money, and then just go on, touching on what real estate, uh, commercial real estate um, professionals look at when they're looking at our community. So this is just of those buildings, um, what is rent like currently in Lexington? Um, for office, you know, we have roughly, it's $34 a square foot. For lab, this is very rough. This is data from um, the real estate brokers as well as CoStar, but um, $58 per square foot in Lexington for lab. Um, and what you see, we compared it to Cambridge, and this is primarily because we often get that comparison that when uh, businesses are looking to relocate, they want to look at when they want to stay within 128, and they do look at places like Waltham, Burlington, and Lexington. Um, and why is that? Well, if you look at Cambridge's cost for lab, um, it's almost 95 to 100 dollars a square foot. And when you look at it, even for office, it's almost twice as much as well. So as you expand, if you're looking to really grow, it does become a cost question for your business. Um, and we still have vacancies. So in, within Lexington, we're about 11% with lab and 8.5% um, vacant with office. So that's aggregating everything. 
uh, but that's just giving you a sense of how much we do have available. Compared to Cambridge again, even with those real steep costs per square foot, um, you're seeing two and two and a half percent vacancies in Cambridge. This reflects a similar thing for Lexington, just that over time, the blue line is the rents per square foot, so you're ending up in the um, 30s. Um, and that's, you know, since when I started in 2012, um, there was about a 36% vacancy in Hartwell. Now, depending on how you um, cut the boundary, that's down to about 15, 12 to 15%, like half that it used to be. So it's doing well, but it's also the overall market is doing well. Um, and the last thing I think is important, partly because um, you know this office oversees this, is a visitor-based economy. Um, and visitor-based economy is not not trying to say that's the only thing that our economy is part of, but it is a strong piece of our economy is the visitor. And I think this is important because what we'll see is over time, the hotel and meals tax has generated a significant amount of income for the town. At this point, um, this was from FY18, it generated 1.36 million directly into the general fund. And we've seen it grow over time. On average, there's been an increase. Last year in 2008, it dipped a little. People often ask me why that might be. I talked to some of the business retailers, they say it was a little bit of a slower year. Also, um, just the political environment, there's less international travel now, um, and that's being um, reported by MOT, which is the Mass Office of Travel and Tourism. So everyone in that has a visitor-based economy or an element of it has seen a dip in the hotel and meals tax a bit. So, and lastly, just to keep in mind that uh, there are um, quite a number of users. We have the Lexington Liberty Ride shuttle that brings in about 8,000 every year. It's about 8,000 users or riders. Um, the Minuteman National Park, their stats say they have 1 million visitors every year. This is a lot of people coming into the town, not only the, um, coming in to kind of see and share kind of the history, but really that's going to be the the real um, engine for our Main Street, meaning, you know, Main Street lives and dies by foot traffic. If you're off the beaten path and no one's coming to you, unless you have a strong online uh, click section, that you're not going to be doing business. Foot traffic is huge for survival for the Center Business District. And I think we want to be mindful of that. And these, these numbers show us that there is, there are a large number of people coming in. Carry Hall Shows is a program that started about three years ago that we contracted with Spectacle Management. And just within, you know, since we started that, we've had 27,000 tickets sold, people coming in. A lot of that's still Lexington residents, but still the exposure and having that come in, anecdotally I know for some of the restaurants has been um, very helpful. And you know where people are coming from. We try to capture this data. This is I will firstly say, please. Don't, this is just from our guest book breakdown. It's um, so bear that in mind. It's just from what we could collect on our guest book. That was our only real way to do it. We haven't done an official statistical survey of everyone, but I think it's just again a little bit of a reminder that we have a lot of internet or a lot of national domestic visitors. Um, we have 11% of the people, at least, who signed the guest book are coming from other countries. And if you're in the visitor center, you will always undoubtedly hear someone from another country in that visitor center. So I know that's a lot of information, and I thank you so much for being patient, and I'm happy with Carol that we could answer any questions that you might have. I'm going to turn on some lights to you. Question. You mentioned that the slides are online. Yes. What else? Uh, they'll be posted on the conference plan website. Yes. Do any of our. Oh, you guys want to share a microphone just for Lex Media, right? Yes. Yeah. Do 
do any of our peer communities um, apply different tax rates for small businesses versus large businesses? Um, as far as I know, no. Um, I know that the assessor had looked into, um, there is one exemption, a small tax, it's small um, business exemption. You have a certain number of people, a certain, uh, the value of your building is below a th certain threshold. And we did the analysis, in case you could remind me what the number was that Rob said. There was only three businesses that um, qualified, thank you. So just for clarity for people, we don't have <clears throat> the freedom to set a different tax rate for small businesses. There is an exemption that's allowed by the state, but you have to own the building, and the vast majority of the buildings in Lexington are not owned by the people who occupy them, which is why we don't apply that discount, and that goes down to the three people you were talking about. Yeah, the owner occupied. Are there any other questions? Thank you. Huh. So I'd just like to add, um, in terms of the visitor-based economy, we have actually in the past done some surveys that we can compare to. One of the things we've done in the past is we've um, detailed the number of jobs that are from that industry which made us within the top five in terms of, of that industry. So I don't know if you want to consider doing that as part of the comprehensive plan, but I, I do think it's important to put into context that the hotel and meals tax, since we really took ownership of trying to grow the visitor space economy, has grown from 400,000 to the 1.4 million over a period of about seven years. And there's tremendous potential there. So in terms of finding tax revenues that are not paid by residents, um, it's really important that we continue to look at this market and, and expand the opportunities, which is what's happening now. And, and I do think for the comprehensive plan, um, we did not have this, um, the data and, and the history, the last times these um, comprehensive plans have been really addressed. So I do hope there'll be a more robust section about the visitor base economy, because that's one of the few places that the town can actually grow revenues that um, do not have a direct impact on, on tourism. And I think you mentioned it sort of briefly, but there's also um, the multiplier factor that comes for every dollar that's raised in the hotel and meals tax. And if people are interested in that, um, on massvacation.com, there's a, all kinds of statistics at the bottom you can click on and, and we can drill down to Lexington. Yes, thank you. Yeah, there is more data we can share. It is one of the top industries, tourism, um, in the state, second largest industry, actually. Um, so we could share that um, on some high level, so we will do that. And, and just to add to that, Lexington and Concord combined, because they look at us as the same entity for statistics, is the third most visited community in the state. That is true. Community what? Uh, Cape Cod and Boston. Yeah, any other questions? Well, I have recently been reading about the dark store theory, which is becoming a real problem in the Midwest and in Texas, and even there have been evidently a case in Massachusetts. And it seems to me that if large corporations can save money and there are lawyers who are willing to take contingency cases on this, that that can become a problem with office space or any other kind of commercial property. And are we at least aware of this as a potential issue? Once it catches on, there'll be a lot of people trying to do this. And I know that defending yourself in these courts is very costly for communities. So, well, we have not experienced that in terms of we don't right. have the retail. Right, we don't have, I mean, you're talking about the big box kind of ghost yes, right now, buildings. Things like Walmart will say, even though this store is successful, there's three stores that are within a 20 mile radius that have been abandoned and they were sold for one tenth the price of what it costs us to build this one and we should be assessed. 
at what the right. resale value is, and they're getting court rulings in their favor. Right. That, yes. We, we, I have not seen that here. We don't have the large big box, um, but we are aware of that. Um, you know, I think there's they're getting some, you know, leniency because of the changing face of re the real estate, or the retail landscape. And so I think that's partly why you're seeing some of that as it adjusts. If you look at you know kind of nationwide statistics, uh, we are extremely overbuilt in retail space, and so that you'll see um, a lot of transition over retail space now. And they're trying to be really creative in how we're changing those types of abandoned abandoned uses, whether it's a grocery store, WalMarts, or something like that, older strip malls. Um, you know, there's I've seen trends towards offices, towards fitness spaces. But what happens is you're right, they'll be devalued over you know, time because of their sale price. Yes, Fred. Oh, maybe please state your okay. name, sir. Fred Johnson. Um, Carol did a great job of setting us up in terms of defining what the values are that we look to for positive outcomes of economic development. You've done a terrific job of providing us with a lot of information about the status quo and the recent history. I guess this is a process question. At what point do we begin to look at the implications of building recommended public policy changes um, for accomplishing some of the objectives of economic development? given where we're starting from and what our recent history has been. Is there, is, will there be another session on economic development prepared by the Comprehensive Plan Committee? And Sarah, are you comfortable answering that one? Maybe Carol's disappeared. Hi, Hi Carol. Do you want to take that? So the phase of the Comprehensive Plan that we are in right now is looking at existing conditions and trends uh, we had, as some of you know, looked at demographics, housing, transportation, and tonight economic development. Still ahead are areas like open space and natural resources, uh, historic resources. Then the, the Comprehensive Plan Advisory Committee will begin to look, combine this knowledge with the values and priorities that have been expressed in uh, three World Cafe events three community input events that were held earlier. Over the summer, we'll get additional, we hope to get additional input through uh, online means. And then in the fall, we stay on schedule in the fall and beyond. That's when the community and the Comprehensive Plan Advisory Committee will start to look at those priorities and consider techniques and methods for trying to help the town to realize, help the community to realize its goals. Through the, through the plan update. So I'm, sh I'm certain that um, there will be some occasions to revisit with the community what our economic development actions will be, our recommended action steps. Does that help, Fred? Yeah. Well, I would add that a lot of those um, discussions take place at our meetings, which are all public meetings. So. Know, anyone is welcome to attend those meetings. And the agenda should be on what oh, is public. Is there all. any information about what we've heard so far from these big cafes or in your public meetings? Yes, so the results of, we had a, I think our initial meeting was on June 4th where we had a big event and then we had the three world cafes. All of the data from that is posted on the website. And do we have yeah, we should put that up on the screen loud and clear. I will find it. I think it's a good The one, the one question. I'm Len Morris working. I guess one of the things that we we struggle with. I'm on the, the comprehensive plan advisory committee. Knowing what the existing conditions are is hugely important. But what's missing more often than not to me is the why. You know, why do we have an 18% vacancy rate in our in our laboratory spaces, if I remember the number right? Mm -hmm. 
when our price per square foot is half of what it is in campus. Um, you know, why do we have a vacancy rate in our office space when our, our you know, when our prices are, are half? So I don't know how or when or if we, those of you who have been putting all this data together, um, have a sense for the why. Um, you know, I can speak to Hartwell because I live where people have to drive to get to Hartwell past my neighborhood. And I can think that I wouldn't want to be there <coughs> because I could be coming down from New Hampshire and my car would be parked somewhere up Route 3, halfway between Lowell and, and the exit because I was trying to get onto 128 and get off onto Bedford Street and then turn left onto Hartwell. And so to me, we need perhaps collectively to start assembling some of those whys because as an engineer, I don't know how to solve problems unless I know what's causing them. Um, you know, I could increase the vacancy, I could increase the occupancy of lab space by lowering the rent, theoretically. Mm -hmm. But if people say, uh, you know, it, it doesn't matter, you can give it away, nobody right. wants to put up with that, whatever that is. Right. And I wonder if, if we as a, as a town and you as, a, as a, um, an economic development person <coughs> have, have burrowed into the why. Um, I have, and I don't know um, at one point when we'll, we'll talk about those. I mean, a lot of that is there's a multifaceted, it's multifaceted in that um, a lot of it is change in market preferences over time. Um, there's things, you know, the example we talk about Hartwell. Um, if you go down Hartwell, there's, it's not, there's no evidence of disinvestment, really. If you really look down there, you know, there's still a lot of occupancy. 11% actually for the suburbs is actually pretty respectable, right? It's a very respectable number. Um, I think what people talk about is going back to that graph when we see the residential kind of increase in value and then the commercial kind of laying flat, roughly speaking, I mean, not terrible. But, um, and so you ask why and then if we drill down, what we've seen is land use policies that have li limited things. So your land use policies have been limited. Your geographic areas where you've decided to allow some of the development is in the environmentally sensitive areas. It's those wetlands. So we have stronger uh, um, regulations now to preserve those, making it more challenging to redevelop those sites. Um, also, on top of that, just for the Hartwell corridor, you have um, Hanscom with flight easements, again, limiting the height of buildings. Um, so those, like, right there are just, like, kind of three factors. You layer in some of the market preferences I talked about. People want not just cheap space, but they want some amenities. So if we're going to pay for some cheaper space, maybe we'll look at Burlington as our option because there's amenities that I can still walk to. They might be harder to walk to, but still on a map, it looks like you have cafes and places to go. Whereas if you look at Hartwell or Hayden, those are going to be your limited options. So, um, so those are pieces of it. And I think as this comp plan goes on, those things will be kind of talked about in more of a forum and try to outline kind of some of the findings or the reveal on the data. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, I'm Betsy Weiss. Um, so I, I did want to go back to the graph. You yeah. just mentioned the fact yeah. that the residential has increased so much and commercial has been stagnant. And the other thing is you mentioned that um, Hartwell Avenue was built in the 60s and 70s, I believe. So if that's the case, then it's dated. And I would think that the fact that Hartwell Avenue needs to be updated, and I think you mentioned amenities, mm -hmm. um, I think that's really important. And that should be an initiative. Um, was there, Betsy, was there a specific question on that? Or are you just more of a comment to? Well, <laughs> um, well, I think it goes to why is the commercial so stagnant, which mm -hmm. I think goes back to um, okay. Leonard Morris Fortier's question, and, and residential <laughs> has increased, and, and is it because it, some of the buildings are dated and there are no amenities on Hartwell, and, mm -hmm. 
it needs to be updated, so I think that that really needs to be addressed, why the commercial valuation hasn't gone up. Yeah, I mean, I think that's important. Um, you know, if we look at just the Hartwell corridor for an example, we have about 1.1 million square feet of commercial or lab office down that corridor. And it's been about that same square footage for a long time. And as I mentioned, there's some physical constraints. Um, but government can't um, do, there's not a lot of local government um, intervention on this other than your land use policy. So I think that's why you know the comp plan has been really important because it lays the blueprint. Do we want to see anything change in this area and how do we want to see it change if we do? Um, because it'll have the impacts on the communities across the way, it'll have the impacts on the transportation kind of access. But then I think we have to say, you know, those are trade-offs that we recognize and this is part of the comp plan discussion as it goes on that, you know, well, maybe we want that if we could add, you know, a new type of zoning or overlay or different mechanisms or amend our zoning. Um, a lot of property owners, we've engaged the property owners in that particular area over the last three years, and the property owners are very interested in changing the zoning. Um, but then we look at the community at large, there's a lot of concern on what that means for the, tra the traffic and the transportation you know, through the corridor. Higher, de high, higher development program, more jobs, more people, more traffic. So assuming that we did want to build higher at Hartwell, what, how high could we go without interfering with the flighty sense at Hanscom? Um, that's a good question because we've looked at that and most of the um, height is, uh, what is that? Sorry. Um, most of that is actually in the northern part where Hartwell and Bedford meet. That's probably the area that you have the most opportunity for a height allowance. And how high can you go? That's up to the community in terms of how, like there's technically in the world, you could probably, you, know, you can build a 10, you know, 10 story skyscraper, but do you want that? Is it fit with your kind of character of your community? And so mostly what we've looked at, the feasibility for redevelopment based on the cost basis to tear down a building and redevelop a building would be about five to six feet tall. Stories. Stories. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Small. 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 Um, no, thank you. Five to six stories tall. So you mentioned that one of the limiting factors were these flight easements. So that's not that's not really an issue if we're talking about five or six or even ten stories. Is that right? Um, no. If we, I mean, if we look at the um, you know the map, Hanscom has a um, flight easement and it kind of gradually kind of goes up it's on the and fly path for the, for the, the flight planes. path thank it's, you it's the only the approach vector for the planes on the for the runways yeah. and it's a it's a a, a a pie slice that goes from the tarmac from the tarmac up into the air and so there's certain based on which taxi which runways in which direction there's specific heights and they apply to everything so like trees so a tree could start. Air conditioning unit. If you own a really nice tree and it's in a glide path and it hits the, they'll they'll make they'll send somebody out there and stand on your property and cut that tree down. They won't so, trim the top. Nope. They'll make sure that you take no you until that top of that tree comes back below that right. threshold. But they actually they'll pay you know we paid a ton of money for trees in Maine for in a glide path to just plant other places so that you don't have to do it. You do it once, cut that tree down plant a whole bunch of trees somewhere else and everybody gets happy. That's the same problem we have. And they're bigger plants. Here. I'm gonna find it right now. Okay. Go, George. Uh, like most things, uh, uh, Hartwell Avenue is a complex situation. But uh, for economic development license, uh, it takes on Lexington's personality. Uh, we don't want to be Somerville, we don't want to be Waltham. And uh, so the, the broad answer for Hartwell Avenue, and the thing you have to be careful of, 
is that the uh, value, the, ec the economic tax revenue side of the equation uh, is reflected in the use of the building. And lab space has the highest value per square foot. So in simple terms, we have a limited amount of square foot available to us to develop. And the highest return on those is lab space. And so our focus on Hartwell Avenue has been for lab. And that's the reason. You could double the size of a building and end up with the same revenue that you have today if you did it with retail or office. So you have to be selective in your strategy. And that's one of the that's one of the equations that we should be looking at going forward. Uh, also with lab space, you have fewer off vehicles. So you're gonna have less traffic. Now, if you increase anything, you're going to increase vehicle traffic, and that means you have to address Bedford Street and the Hartwell Avenue intersection. There are solutions for that as well, but, but we may need to think in terms of not waiting for the federal government to finance it, but how we can do it ourselves. So that's another equation that we should look at. And I'm full of suggestions, but uh, I'm not handing them out tonight. So, um, I'm Richard Canale, I'm the planning board and the town's designee to the Boston MPO. So today, our town manager um, went into the Boston MPO to um, seek funding, um, initial stages for uh, transportation improvements on Hartwell, Bedford Street, Wood Street. And um, back in 2007, when we rezoned, when town meeting rezoned, um, it actually allows a building owner right now can actually apply um, to build a 10-story office tower. Um, so that's in the present zone. Um, they can do that right now. Um, but part of it and part of the response that um, our project, so it's unfortunate that when we said at the time, we need to fix the infrastructure, uh, we haven't done it. I think our new town manager is really anxious to help solve the transportation problem. And um, unfortunately, it may take a while for that to occur, but the MPO did indicate it was willing to um, uh, put in the plan to say um, um, out of uh, our financial constraints up to almost $50 million for infrastructure improvements, but not till 2030. Um, we're going to try and see if we can get that sooner, a lot sooner. But part of the question, part of the things in terms of trade-offs um, that members of the MPO will make those decisions um, we're sort of saying, great, is this going to be mixed use? Yes, it's going to be mixed use. And so part of the question is, how many hundreds of units, residential units, um, are we going to put up? How, and what's the implication for that? And, um, you know, um, so part of it is, um, how do we get a plan that's going to be mixed use um, in which um, we can hopefully um, have residents work there. Um, hopefully, um, I think we're going to need to do things like increasing um, transit, maybe doubling the number of express buses, uh, intertown buses, that type of thing, uh, in order to, to be successful to increase the density in Hartwell to any great degree. So again, all of it is part of, you know, what our values are and how it works out. So back in the um, when we did the cafe. So we have a lot of information about what people said they valued. 
and the comprehensive plan committee is going to have to relook at that now that we have we're starting to get a good idea of what's here to start to look at um, what those principles are and how they factor in so that um, um, we do have the guidelines in terms of how do we write the comprehensive plan how do we figure we have to know where we want to get to and I think we've got some really good input we're telling people where we are right now and over the next few months I think the committee is going to have to start distilling what we heard from the cafe especially in light of this reach out to the community again say this is what we heard is that really correct and then um, start to be able to write it and hopefully by this time next year we'll be in a hopefully a, a good position to have some of these questions answered because it's really some basic questions about what we want Lexington to be when it grows up. Thank you. Um, Betsy Weiss, um, I just want to say that in light of all of our capital debt, we pro presently have $70 million in capital debt from Hastings and from the fire station and um, Lexington Children's Place, and then we have the police station and the high school. So I would hope that increased commercial tax revenue would be one of the goals and priorities of the comprehensive plan. And I think Hartwell Avenue is a perfect opportunity to try to do that. I understand the transportation issues on Bedford Street, and it sounds like the town manager is addressing them, but um, they have to be addressed, and increased commercial tax revenue has to be addressed as well. I'm just curious. I noticed that there are a couple of buildings across from the GPW on Bedford Street, yeah, residential buildings that look like they're going to be demolished. And also, um, adjacent to the DPW on Bedford Street, do we know what's going to be going in there? In either one of those, or both of them? Julie, do you know? Not specifically, so. I, don't, I do not know. The, one of the residents of Reed Street yes. said they bought. This is separate from 186 Bedford, correct? Yeah. Oh, do you, I'm sorry, ma'am. Did you mean 186 Bedford Street? No. Oh, okay. I'm like 93. Not nine, it could have. It must be a higher number than that. Right next to the DPW on Bedford Street, oh, yeah. on well, this side true. of the street, right. and then the on the opposite there. side of the street would be the 186, and then going toward 128. There are there's there's at least one house, if not two houses, on Bedford yeah. Street that looks like they're yeah. about to fall down if not taken down. Yeah. I, I, at one of the meetings, there was a woman who lives in the Reed Street area, and she said they had bought that building that's falling down that's next to 186. I don't know anything about the property next to the DPW, but she said they were just planning on putting in a single family residence and tearing down the existing house and they've taken out some trees and things in preparation for that. Um, any other questions? <clears throat> Is there anyone else who hasn't asked a question yet? Okay. So I just wanted to quickly say I, I do think we have to be realistic in the comprehensive plan that Lexington has prioritized many years ago it being basically primarily a residential community. So in some ways, I'm not surprised that the residential growth has taken place. Um, I think there's a lot of tolerance for maximizing what we can do in the existing um, commercial areas, like Hartwell Ave and Hayden Avenue, but as you expand from that, then it starts to get harder and harder to get votes from town meeting to make significant changes. But I, I do wonder, um, you know, we've done a great job with the biotech industry over the last few years and the laboratory space, which gets more revenue. We've done a great job with the visitor base economy, which is something we're taking advantage of people coming anyway. What other areas has have been identified or are you thinking about that may also increase some of the commercial areas of the commercial sectors 
Um, and you don't necessarily have to have that answer today, but it would be helpful as we talk about the comprehensive plan to have an idea of where you see industry opportunities that might complement the thoughts of the community. Um, yeah, I think you know part of that is kind of being exposed to some of the national trends. And for example, um, next week, you know, I'm going to an MIT with the next evolution of real estate and commercial real estate. And that's interesting because I mean everything from the technology and data storage to Amazon's transportation, uh, physical and commercial needs have evolved. You know, does that necessarily impact us right now today? Not necessarily, but are these larger trends we need to see how they do impact the region and then how these smaller nodes can kind of meet them. I think one thing um, I've seen over time, and I've been here about six and a half years, um, when, the, when I first started, the economic development goals set by um, the Board of Selectmen was to focus on Hartwell, increase the occupancy, focus on the life science cluster, and then focus on center vitality. And that in particular, they wanted to focus in on parking. Um, and in my time, we've worked on parking. We updated the meters. We updated the policies. We got transportation going down Hartwell. The overall market has picked up, so you see a lot of um, occupancy going up. And the life science cluster has kind of taken its own um, it's kind of mini cluster here in Lexington. So. Those are all sort of strengths, but I see it as how you want to kind of preserve and enhance your existing commercial versus doing um, a Somerville type of transformational development. Because when you start talking about transformational change, you start taking these zoning districts and either expanding them to changing like a use that is maybe a residential use to commercial. I don't see that happening. So I see that these areas that are existing commercial areas are what we have now and what we're most tolerant and expect to enhance over the next coming years. And then how do we do that in the most kind of going back to the triple line to, you know, that it's, you know, smart for people, creating a smart sense of place, right for the environment, making sure either it's net zero policies are in place for new technology, for new buildings, or and making it feasible, because you can't put in you know, these great policies, but then if it's not feasible from the development aspect, you won't see the redevelopment happen. So we're trying to be mindful of those things in the areas that we have now. Okay, and I, I just want to emphasize one other thing. Um, Carol, in her presentation, I was very happy to hear her use the word innovation. And Often in the comprehensive plan, we focus on just the land and, and just you know the economic development pieces being sort of more mechanical, which is a trend within the towns. One of the ways that tourism has become so successful in the visitor-based economy was thinking of innovative ways to take advantage of what was already here. And so I'd like to see that somehow we the innovation piece reflected in the comprehensive plan, because um, I think I agree with you in terms of the tolerance, but there are ways that we can be more creative in, in what we're promoting for our economic development in that context. Okay, thank you. Any other questions or comments? Um, I think, yeah. Yeah, so you had talked earlier about the um, Lexington Center, East Lexington, countryside. Right, the businesses. smaller commercial. And it areas. seems that um, we probably should be looking more at those areas. I think, you know, 186 Bedford Street, I think, can be a model sort of going forward. Um, yeah. You know, there was a link that Joe Pato had sent out on what folks are doing in Arlington Heights. Mm -hmm. And it seems that that's probably maybe some of the things that we might want to do in on Mass Ave in um, East Lexington. And I know folks in East Lexington have indicated, you know, they've got these little mini strip malls. And, um, you know, there's probably a lot of things that we can do to enhance that area and to sort of have some synergy with what's going on in Arlington to bring some of that business along 
to here. And I think the same thing. Um, I know we had an attempt to uh, do some things in Lexington Center. And um, a lot of the input that we got from the cafe is how do we ensure that we have the economic vitality in the center. And I think, you know, Bedford Street, Merritt um, are, are good things. And so I think we need to look at all, all of it and look at all of it as local economic development and how do we bring and maintain vitality in, in that city. Thank you, Mr. Kennelly. And thank you, everyone, um, for coming tonight. Thank you, Carol, for a great show. We also want to give you the URL for the comprehensive plan web page on the town's website. It's lexingtonma.gov slash C-O-M-P-E-L-A-N, comp plan. There's also a beautiful website that's uh, Lexington ma.gov comp hyphen plan but most of the presentations and a lot of the information is on the town website and we're still getting some information onto the beautiful website so this presentation and the slides will be on the town's website and all the prior ones are as well richard yeah i just i just want to shut this up i just want to uh, let people know in this room that we have a dozen folks who are on this comprehensive plan committee and they bring such a diverse um, wealth of ideas and I think they represent the town um, comprehensively and um, I think you should have some faith that um, you're going to get a good product from them. And again, I think this kind of input is helpful for them, so um, I think this is a, a helpful. That's great. Thank you, Richard. And thanks again, Melissa. Very nice.